Hi there, once again, this is Corey Smith with the Petersburg Church of Christ, and this is our study of the book Muscle and a Shovel, written by Michael J. Shank, and today we're picking up with chapter 17 of that book. If you have been following along, or maybe this is your first time tuning in, uh, let me say first and foremost, I'm up here on Facebook Live on the Petersburg Church of Christ website or Facebook page, and then here if you're watching uh, this is broadcasting live and will be archived on our website at www.scatteringtheseed.com. If you're watching up here on Facebook Live, I would encourage you to head over to the website, scatteringtheseed.com. Up at the top of the page, you will see the link for the Muscle and a Shovel online study. And then you can scroll down and find the link to chapter 17 and when you click on that link, you will find the YouTube video that's attached to that page where we have the book that I'm going to read to you, of chapter 17. Uh, chapter 17 is rather lengthy. It's about 20 pages long, at least here on the way that I'm reading it. It may not be that way in the book, but it's a rather lengthy chapter and encourage you to follow along as there. And then once we finish reading the chapter, we'll have some discussion on it as well. So this morning, let me get the... Uh, let me get the screen up here so that we can share that and uh, share the entire screen and present to everyone. Okay. Uh, what I would like to start with this morning, if I can, I'll say morning. I don't know what time it's where you're watching. It's morning here where I am. Let's start out by looking at some of the discussion. We're going to read a few, a few Bible verses that go along with this as well. If you have your Bible, uh, be turned into John chapter 12. And if you don't, again, if you're here on Facebook Live, you can come over to our website and I have it here on the screen for you. John chapter 12. We're going to look at verse 48. John chapter 12, verse 48. Again, these are a few verses that go along with the study this morning. Jesus says, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Let's also look at Matthew chapter 7. And verse 21. I spelled that right, wouldn't it? Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Again, Jesus talking. He says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And then the last verse we want to look at before we get into our study today, Matthew chapter 15, verse 1. Matthew chapter 15, verse 1. And that will actually go on into, make sure I got that right there. That doesn't, that context doesn't look right. I guess it is. We'll read the whole chapter here. Read a few verses, not the whole chapter, but a few verses. Matthew 15, verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. And then I will go ahead and add verse 3 here. But he, being Jesus, answered and said unto them, Why do you, or why do ye, also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Let me read that passage for you again so that you get the full context of it. Then came Jesus to the scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, why do the disciples just transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Okay. A couple of points we want to make also here before we get into the reading the book and then discussing it. A couple of action points you might want to take this week. Pray with your family on bended knees this week. 
you will find that it is a wonderful experience. Research the mode of baptism, the mode of baptism. Research it, not just in the Bible, but also look up the definition of baptism or baptizo in the Greek language. And then memorize another note card. If you're new to this study, what that means is those verses we just read, write those verses down on a three by five index card and begin to memorize what those verses say. As you've been following along in the study, you will understand that is part of assisting you in the work of evangelism. And that's not just the work of the man standing at the pulpit. It is the work of every single Christian to go out and take the gospel to the world. So let's get into the book, chapter 17. Pardon me, I'm going to get a little drink of water before I start here because this is a long chapter. January 1988. Life was busy, busy for everyone. Time and responsibility slowed for no one. It is funny to hear people say, when things slow down, I'll dot, 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 dot. Well, things never slow down. The company I worked for was no different. OSI was booming. Our department had 11 technical engineers, and each TE ran an average of five calls per working day. At an average of 22 working days per month, each TE ran a monthly average of 110 calls. The bulk of my January calls came from my church accounts due to their unusually high December printing volumes. The holidays created heavier duty cycles on their equipment, resulting in higher breakdown percentages and an increased need for service. Between marriage, work, entertainment, and life in general, I was reading the Bible continuously. My knowledge of the Bible was growing and navigating the Bible became easier as time passed. I was not a fanatic nor did I want to be. I simply wanted to be able to defend what I believed with the Bible. This principle is found in the latter part of 1 Peter 3, verse 15, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken the same shall judge him in the last day, John chapter 12, verse 48. In other words, it seemed to me that the words of Christ might possibly be the measuring rod or the benchmark used in determining man's eternal destiny. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. How would any of us figure out the will of the Father without reading the Father's will? Two things are certain in life, death and taxes. Some people had figured out how to get out of paying their taxes, but I have yet to meet anyone who has figured out a way of getting out of dying. That meant at least one thing is certain. If you know without a doubt that you are going to die someday and Christ said that you were going to be judged, doesn't it make sense to find out what you will be judged by? It doesn't take a PhD to answer the question. At any rate, there I was standing in Cookville, Tennessee, in one of the Methodist churches and finishing up a service call on a Gestiner mimeograph. What's the damage? asked the jovial Methodist minister. No charge, I replied. It's under contract and it's in great shape. Just sign here. I said, putting the service ticket down on the unoccupied secretarial desk and pointing to the signature line. As he signed the ticket, I tried to decide whether or not to ask him. It was early in the afternoon. The church was small. There was no one else in the building. And the minister looked bored. The Methodist baptized. I remembered that it was amazing what you could find out if you just asked. Yes, of course, he responded as he signed the ticket. I tore off his copy and handed it to him. We sprinkle, pour, or immerse, depending on the individual and the situation, the minister replied. You do all three? I was surprised. Sure, but a lot depends on the person, he said. But isn't baptism immersing someone, I asked. 
The Bible doesn't specify the mode of baptism, the minister explained. Sometimes in administering the sacrament to young children, you can't immerse them. So sprinkling is the best option. However, some people wish to be immersed, and that's fine too. Methodists aim to please, don't they? I replied with a smile. He smiled back. Well, we certainly try to accommodate. Driving back to Nashville gave me a considerable amount of time to think about the conversation I just had with the pleasant minister at the Methodist church. The Bible doesn't specify the mode. His statement looped in my mind. This was a new one on me. I didn't know if the Bible specified the mode or not, but I knew someone who might have the answer. He was back at the office. Randall, I got his attention as I came through the back door. What's up, Mr. Mike? He quickly returned my greeting. <clears throat> Grab your Bible, preacher man. I've got a good question for you today. I exclaimed as we both made a beeline toward his desk. Studying the Bible with Randall had grown on me. Mr. Mike, you ever going to find that sinner's prayer for me? Randall asked through a big grin and bright eyes. Good things come to those who wait, I replied in a slow mock radio voice. Randall laughed and said, man, you're full of it. What do you have for me today? Just talked to a Methodist minister who said that the Bible doesn't specify the mode of baptism. He said that sprinkling, pouring, or immersion is just fine. Doesn't matter. It only depends on the person and the situation. I recited my previous conversation with the Methodist minister as accurately as possible. We heard a loud, shrill, beeping signal and looked towards the left. It was Jeremy backing up on a forklift. I looked back at Randall. He was shaking his head in the negative. He had leaned back against his desk with the legs crossed and arms folded, considering what I had just told him. To think that this man leads others, Randall said, looking toward the floor as if he was talking out loud to himself. He continued talking to the floor, but he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Where's that verse, I asked. Matthew 15, verses 13 to 14, replied Randall without hesitation, but still looking at the floor. Then he looked up at me. Mr. Mike, there's good people in every denomination, just like there's some truth in every denomination. Every denomination does some good. Every denomination teaches some truth. And every denomination is made up of a lot of good-hearted, loving, sincere people. When you and I talk about these things, I want you to remember that I'm not criticizing the people involved in the denomination. I'm only rebuking their false doctrine, and I'll do so till the day I die. I do it because I love the truth, and I love their souls. Uh, yeah, Randall, I realize that, I said. But Mr. Mike, we must refute false doctrine with the Bible. The Bible refutes their beliefs. For the Bible is the living, breathing word of the Almighty God. I had never seen Randall in such an agitated state. He was clearly frustrated and angry by the Methodist comments. Randall continued, Methodism began with a man named John Wesley in the mid-late 1700s. Wesley was marked as a Methodist because of the methodical way in which he opposed the clergy of the Church of England. His method grew into a movement. I tell you all this to make a point. The point is that John Wesley came out of the Church of England, which came out of the Roman Catholic Church. Catholics baptized by sprinkling and pouring, and they believe in baptizing babies. Even though Methodism is a form of the Protestant movement, that's protesting against the many false doctrines of Catholicism, such as the Pope being God on earth, worshiping and praying to images, praying to Mary, transubstantiation, etc., etc. Many Catholic practices carried over into the Methodist Church. I followed him. Mr. Mike, the baptismal mode is certainly specified in the Bible, Randall emphasized by raising his voice, and that minister is ignorant of the Greek language. He's ignorant of biblical history, and he's ignorant of God's word. Randall was being as harsh as I had ever seen him be. He began turning the pages of his Bible furiously. 
I just watched and waited. How could any man call himself a minister of God and be so ignorant of the word? Randall was rambling to himself as he looked for his target text. How could an entire group of people follow such ignorance and never check the record for themselves? Do they not realize that God will hold them accountable for what they believe and do? He continued to talk to himself, getting angrier with each word that he spoke. All right, Randall, calm down. I tried to insert as he turned the pages of his Bible. I'm sorry, Mr. Mike, he apologized, but a man's soul is serious business. The most serious of any business. It is not to be played with. Randall found what he was looking for and slid his Bible over so that I could read it with him. Michael Shank, come to the front desk. Michael Shank, come to the front desk. The announcement buzzed through the overhead intercom. It was hard to hear the forklift running behind us, but we both caught the name. Randall, I've got to go to the front office. All right, Mr. Mike, just come back here when you're done. This is too important to put off. Randall said as I walked away from his desk and towards the front of the building. I'll be right back, I shouted back to Randall as I made my way through the warehouse. It took a minute to get from the back of the office to the front of the building. When I reached the front showroom floor, I saw Janetta standing there with dinner to go in her hands. I had forgotten all about tonight. Monday nights were the one night of the week that the technical engineers worked an additional three hours until 8 p.m. when necessary to catch up on any backlogged in-shop repairs. Jonetta remembered that I was scheduled to stay late that evening, so here she was bringing me dinner at the office. I bet you're getting hungry, she said as she kissed me on the cheek. Pardon me, it was a rigid voice from somewhere behind us. We both moved aside. Ledger Stavik was staying or trying to work his way around us as we stood in the door that separated the showroom from the accounting offices. Mr. Stavik, I'd like you to meet my wife, I said, but he interrupted with a curt and snotty hello. He never looked at her, didn't turn to shake hands, didn't even turn his head in our direction when he spoke. Jack's son, I presume, Janetta asked, already knowing that it was Ledger. How'd you guess? I feigned surprise as we started laughing in unison. He's such a hush, she interrupted my foul expletive. Look in the sack. Jonetta was excited about what she had brought. I've got you something special. She certainly had. Pulled pork barbecue with hot sauce on the side, a large tub of slaw, and a container of dill pickles, baked beans, potato salad, cornbread, and cheesecake. An entire cheesecake. Thought you'd like it, Jonetta grinned as she said the words. No, I don't like it. I love it. But an entire cheesecake? The cheesecake is for the guys in your department, not for you. I'm making you a cake at home tonight. I hugged and kissed her, promised to be home around 8.30, told her to be careful on the icy roads, and thanked her for bringing me supper. Things like that made it for a happy marriage. Don't think that I didn't return the little things to her. She'd skim me alive if I didn't. Before going back to Randall, I took the cheesecake over to my department and put it out on the conference table. The guys flocked around it like a bunch of buzzards. They loved Jonetta too. I then made a quick stop in the parts department to check on an order. No luck. The parts I needed had not arrived. Standing there in the parts department, I grabbed the Merlin phone receiver next to the system terminal on the parts counter and dialed shipping and receiving. Randall picked up. Hey, Randall, you like barbecue? All right. So let's take a look here at some of the discussion. What verse did Randall quote after Mike told Randall what the Methodist minister had said about the mode of baptism? Think about that for a minute. What verse did Randall quote after Mike? told Randall what the Methodist minister had said about the mode of baptism. Well, he quoted Matthew 15, 13 to 14. Since we're right here in Matthew 15, let's look at that. But he answered and said, every plant which my heavenly father had not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. It's interesting. Why do you think he quoted that because the discussion is about the mode of baptism. And the first thing that comes to Randall's mind as we were reading the story there was that verse 
where he said they'll be blind leaders of the blind, both fall in a ditch. But he also said, let them alone because every plant which by heavenly father hath not planted shall be rooted up. What's Randall implying there? Randall's implying that any mode of baptism other than what is talked about and taught in the scripture is something that God did not put in place. And Randall is simply saying, actually Jesus said it, Randall's quoting it. If God didn't plant it, it'll be rooted up. Now, how's it going to be rooted up? Well, Randall talked about that. He said, you've got to compare it to what the word taught, what the truth taught, what the record teaches. Let's move on to the next question here because it all ties together. What did Randall say about people in denominations? Did he say that every denomination is full of sorry people, full of liars? No, he didn't say that. He didn't say that. Randall said that every denomination, <clears throat> excuse me, every denomination has some good people. They teach some truth and they do some good. Randall's not against the people in denominations. I'm not against people in denominations sitting here teaching this lesson. Randall loves their souls. I love your souls. Those of us at the Petersburg Church of Christ love your soul. What we are against is the false teaching. That's why we do things like our live broadcasts. That's why we go through this study of muscle and a shovel to let the word show you the error of the teaching that has been going on for hundreds of years. And many people, as we saw in earlier chapters of the book, are like the daughter cutting off the end of the ham. Why did she cut off the end of the ham? Because mama always cut off the end of the ham. Why did mama cut off the end of the ham? Because grandma cut off the end of the ham. Why did grandma cut off the end of the ham? Because the ham wouldn't fit into the pot she had. Nobody ever questioned why grandma did it. They just did it because grandma did it. Never mind, they might have had a pot that the ham would have fit into, but because she always cut the end off, well, that must be what we must do. Randall's concern that God will hold a people, discuss Randall's concern that God will hold people accountable for what they believe and do. Well, that goes back to the verse we read in John chapter 12, excuse me, Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, to enter in the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is heaven. Well, what is the will of the Father? John chapter 12, verse 48. Where do we find what the will says? If you've ever dealt with a will, with, with a loved one that has passed away, a will has specific things in it. And people are known to put some crazy things in a will. Especially if you take someone who has a very controlling spirit about them, they can still con exercise control over their loved ones, even beyond the grave through a will. Trust me, I've, I've seen it happen with friends that I've grown up with who have had grandparents and whatnot that have passed away, left a lot of money, but they set out specifics in the will that you must do X, 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 Y, and Z, or don't do X, Y, and Z in order to inherit what this will lays out that says you are entitled to. Well, Jesus talks about that in John chapter 12, verse 48. He that rejects me, he that rejects Jesus. Well, who rejected Jesus? Go back over to Matthew 15. The Pharisees did. They didn't like him. Why? He says, he that rejecteth me, receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him. Is it me? No. Is it Benny Burns? No. Is it all those mean-spirited people down at the Petersburg Church of Christ? Nope. Who is it that judges you? The word that Jesus has spoken, that same shall judge us in the last day. 
So why is Randall so adamant about what is being taught by, in this case here in chapter 17, this Methodist minister that Michael Shank has talked to that day on a service call? That minister has said, well, we administer many different modes of baptism. It's all depending on what the individual wants. But when we study the Bible, there is a specific mode. Look at Romans chapter six to find out what that specific mode is. It's common sense when you apply that verse to it. Randall is adamant about the truth being taught because the souls of people are at stake. And because of the ignorance, what Randall says, and he's right, the ignorance of someone who stands in a position of influence, much like a minister in a pulpit, and is teaching something that's just simply been passed down to him from generation to generation, and he's never bothered to check it himself, not only is he putting his own soul in jeopardy, but the very people he claims to be ministering to, he's putting their soul in jeopardy too. So what's his concern that God will hold a pe people accountable for what they believe and do? Friend, not only is he going to hold your minister or your pastor accountable, he's going to hold you accountable. Why? Because you weren't like the Bereans. What? What did the Bereans do? Even when Paul came to them, they still had the scriptures out checking what he was saying. If you're not checking out the man, or in some cases the woman, that's a whole other discussion for another day, standing in your pulpit and teaching you, if you're not checking them out, this is going to sound harsh when I say this, you're lazy. What? You're lazy. You don't care about your own soul enough to check out what's being spoon fed to you. More people, listen, I'm going to kind of get on a Randall rant here. The people are so concerned about the ingredients on a label. I'm holding up a bottle of water. We hope it's just pure H2O in here. If I had a food box here, I would use it for an illustration. People will check out the ingredients on something they're about to eat, but they'll never check out what's being fed to them from a pulpit. Why is that? Well, I don't know the Bible, and this is what we pay this person to do. If you're doing that, if you have that mentality about it, you're putting your own soul in jeopardy. Check out. I hope you're not taking what I tell you for just accepting it because, well, he must know what he's doing. You know, I, I couldn't ever get on there on that camera and talk like that. Listen, there's a lot of folks that get on camera, get on record and talk and tell you things that aren't true. And please don't you ever take what I sit here and say for granted. And if I say something that does not line up with scripture, I hope you'll tell me. But don't just tell me, well, you, my preacher said, I don't care what your preacher said. You show me what the Bible said. You tell me, you start out with what well, my preacher said, and I'll show you some sorry preachers. I'll show you some sorry preachers. And I'm not talking about young guys either. I'm talking about some up in their 60s, 70s, and 80s from respected brotherhood universities. I couldn't tell you any more about what the Bible says and the man the moon. If you are married, getting back to the discussion here, I told you I was getting on a random rant. <laughs> if you are married, what can you do this week to serve your spouse? Think about Jonetta. Think about the end of the story. Randall and Mike are about to dive into a Bible study. And what happened? What interrupted it? Was it work? Not really. Jonetta had remembered that Mike had to work late that night. He had completely forgotten about it. She hasn't. And what does she do? On a cold January night, snow and ice on the ground, she goes to the trouble, not only to bring him lunch, bring him dinner, a nice dinner. Barbecue, pulled pork barbecue, just and the way that Mike describes it is apparently the way that he likes it. Pulled pork barbecue, hot sauce on the side, some dill pickles, baked beans, potato salad, coleslaw. Oh, and by the way, she brought the guys in the department a whole cheesecake. 
So was she just thinking about her husband? No, she was thinking about the guys that he worked with as well. Was she serving her husband? Absolutely she was. But what did Mike also say? He said, I don't forget that. And I try to do everything I can if it's just the little things, the little things. It's also interesting to note that he said, if I didn't do that, she would skin me alive. But think about how can you serve your spouse this week? Guys, it could be something as simple as, in my case, taking the trash out without being asked, helping out with the kids, running them to a ball practice, getting them dressed, making sure they're behaving, brushing their teeth, getting up for school on time. Wives, what can you do? Got the example there, Janetta. Something that you don't have to be asked to do, you do it because you want to do it. Now, if you're not married, think about what you can do this week to serve a friend, a family member, or another Christian. You know, we look back at the beginning of this study. Someone maybe has been absent from the worship assembly for a couple of weeks. Call and check on them. Don't say you need to get back to the assembly. They already know that. They know they haven't been there. They know they need to get back. But ask them, is everything okay? Is there something I can do to help you out with? You know, what can I do for you? Don't look, don't look down. Here. Listen, let me tell you, I, I, I got to thinking about this yesterday. Growing up in the church, and I got away from it for a while. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie to you. And I'm gonna tell you why I got away from it for a while. Because there were people in that congregation who took the attitude of, you better be here. And they would beat you over the head if you weren't there. And they would sit across the auditorium and look down their nose at you. Why? Because you weren't as good as they were. You weren't that particular family. Trust me, I've lived it, okay? Look at it from a servant's point of view. What is wrong? How can I help? What can I do to make it better? It may be that that person is just struggling with something at home and they need somebody to listen to them. And that can be the way that you serve them. Next question. Mike and Randall ate a late dinner that Monday night at the office. How does breaking bread with people affect a relationship? <clears throat> well, typically what happens when you sit down and eat with someone, more often than not, you talk to them. It opens up the opportunity for dialogue and discussion. No doubt, Mike comes back in and think about that too. That kind of goes back to the last question. Who did Janetta bring the barbecue for? She brought it for Mike. But when Mike walked back into the department, what does he say? Hey, Randall, how do you like barbecue? He's going to share it with his friend. And that's going to lead to an opportunity to get back into the discussion that they're talking about with this different modes of baptism that the Methodist minister is talking about. Christians in the first century met daily from house to house and ate meals with one another. How often do you meet and eat with Christians. I can't answer that question for you. Is the only time, let me ask it this way. Oh, here, let me, let me step on. Let me ref, let me ruffle some feathers here. Is the only time that you meet with Christians and eat with them a potluck dinner that's held at the building? If it is, that's great that you're doing that but is that genuine? What do you mean is that genuine? What I mean is how often are you meeting with a fellow Christian, a person who is a member of the Lord's church as described in Acts chapter two, verse 47. Some of you are going to go read that verse and say, Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's leaving a lot of people out that I call Christians. Let me remind you of what Randall said here. Did Randall say that there were a lot of Christians in denominations? That's not what he said. 
Randall said there were a lot of good people in denominations. What did Jesus say? Matthew 7, 21. I'm going to show it to you so that you don't know that you can't say, well, you just see this, made that up. What did Jesus say? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Are you spending time with Christians or are you spending time with good people? Good people can have the best of intentions, but the road to hell can also be paved in good intentions too. Be very careful who you spend your time with. If you're spending more time with people of the world, don't be surprised if you end up being a person of the world. If you spend the majority of your time hanging out with those in denominations that are adhering to the false doctrine of denominations, don't be surprised if all of a sudden you're starting to say, well, maybe that is right. I apologize for any background noise that you may be hearing. This is life with a three-year-old. <laughs> but when you're constantly around those who are obedient to the truth of the scripture, it's amazing that you will suddenly find yourself studying the scripture. It's also worth noting that in this story, Michael Shank is not a Christian at this point. Who's he spending a lot of time with? Randall. What does Randall consume himself with? Randall knows the Bible like the back of his hand. He can rattle it off book, chapter, and verse. Not only does he know it, he lives it and practices it. Who you spend your time with is who you're going to be like. The Christians in the first century met daily. Was it one Sunday night a week? No. Was it, well, we got a gospel meeting coming up. We got to cook a casserole and eat dinner together. No. That's not what he said. He said daily. Who can you find on a daily basis who is going to help you grow more as a Christian? That's the question to ask yourself today. And how often do you meet and eat with other Christians? Is it only when the church leadership says you need to, if that's the case, you might want to rethink that. You might want to try a little harder to find someone that you could sit down with a couple of day or one day a week outside of the gathering of the congregation and just eat with and discuss things with. It could be like this right here. I mean, we're, I'm not specifically, you and I are not talking back and forth to each other. But I'll be the first to tell you, this does a lot of good for me too. Why? Because it forces me to sit down and open up the word of God and study it. And I hope that you benefit from it. I hope this has been beneficial to you today, this study. Again, this has been chapter 17 of the book, Muscle and a Shovel by Michael Shank. If you have questions, you will look below here if you're following along on our website. If you're watching this on Facebook Live, by the way, uh, if you tuned in late, I would encourage you to head over to our website, www.scatteringtheseed.com. Top of the page, you will see the link to Muscle and Shovel Online Study, and then you can click on Chapter 17. If you have questions or comments, there is a place below the video there where you can send those to us. If it's been helpful to you, let us know. If you disagree with something, let us know because we'd like to talk to you about it as well. Not that we won't beat you over the head with it, but we want to understand, try to come to an understanding of what you disagree about. And then let's look at what the Bible says about what you disagree about. We invite you to join us for our assemblies on Sunday morning, 10 a.m. Bible study, worship at 11. And again, Sunday evening at 6 p.m. Wednesday nights, we meet at 7 p.m. for Bible study. If you're here local in the Petersburg area, and I'm talking about 15, we have people that drive as far as 20 miles to be with us. Come be with us. If you're not, if it's not feasible for you to be there, 
We broadcast our services live on our website, www.scatteringtheseed.com. Again, my name is Corey Smith of the Petersburg Church of Christ. This has been Chapter 17 of the book, Muscle and the Shovel. Until next time, God bless. Have a great day.